The umamis. Wow. Whoa. Both hey, umamis. <laughs> Both umamis. G reg. <laughs> you guys just got done premiering uh, a series of Neil deGrasse Tyson shorts at Bufferfest. And personally, I thought maybe I'm biased, but I thought it was the it was the by far the best one there, effortlessly. <laughs> all the other Buffer Fest people, they had invested all this money and time, and like you know, vis- visually impressive. But you guys just effortlessly blew them out of the water. <laughs> I think. Tell us about the tell us about your obsession with Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, How did that start? Where did that come from? Well, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson has a, like an inherent f- funniness to him. Even when he's being serious, just by the way he's presenting himself, he's kind of got like Mark Zuckerberg energy, you know, mm-hmm. where there's like, there's like he has like inherent funny attributes without doing anything really, <laughs> and he's not a comedian. He's got a, gr- a grandfatherly presence. And I always thought that you know, no one has really talked about him for about five years. Like he kind of peaked like early two thousand tens, I guess. Mm-hmm. And so it's really it'd be interesting to make a whole s- hyper specific series about someone that's kind of like out of the sphere of relevancy, mm-hmm. <laughs> which you did, and then yeah, berate my audience ob- about it for weeks in advance, and then hype them up like. Yeah, that's after I showed you the meme about him kissing himself. So. I mean, <laughs> oh, oh, the the tweet he makes every year. Yes. <laughs> yes, they've uh, they've tracked the amount of uh, words it takes for him to express that thought. Where in a mirror you can only kiss Very yourself. Very scientifically. Yeah. Um, what did you call it? Tyson's law. Tyson's law. Yes, uh, which is every three years the number of words he uses to describe that exact tweet uh, halves until the point where he will eventually projected reach the singularity. <laughs> It's like Moore's law. If Moore's law is every two years, the amount of transistors on a circuit board doubles, or so, it's something like that. Mm-hmm. So it's very scientific. So the umamis, both umamis here. <laughs> <cuts you> off. <laughs> <laughs> very interesting. Move on. Uh, tell me, tell me about, tell me about you guys. You guys are are the couple known as umami. That's that's that's. I believe exactly what you said. You want to be referred to as. <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. he really yeah. enjoys being referred to things that are very <laughs> girlfriend, boyfriend, yeah. wife, and yeah. husband. And no. So, <laughs> so you, you you've managed to make a a, a duo, a wife husband duo, <laughs> of animation. <laughs> Uh, yes, I guess we could put it that way. What, what, yeah. what are, how do you divvy the, up the, like, who's responsible for what? It's pretty vague, honestly, but, I mean, he's more technically inclined than I am, and, uh, a lot of our writing is a lot of talking out loud, so huh. it's not really, like... Yeah, so I do mostly the technical animation stuff, but then Caroline and I help, like, she kind of, like, clarifies and helps write my ideas, and... I'll I'll just like give her crap ideas all week until she, one of them makes her laugh or something. I polish it, you know. Right. <laughs> and then sometimes when we're improvising, Carolina will like make things much funnier than they were initially, you know, right. just by changing a few things. Right. So I'm not familiar with any Carolinas. There's only Umami one and Umami two. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. Okay. So Umami. Umami. The, Umami. the Umamis is the yeah. as the as the group entity. Yeah. When I'm talking to you, I'll I'll stare directly in between <laughs> you and treat you yeah. like a hive mind. It's like a- Bacterium that's dividing. So, after the uh, after the fest yesterday, uh, one person walked up to me and they were like, "What did that guy? How did that guy animate it?" You know, like mm. like people were talking about it. Yeah. Uh, you use Photoshop to animate, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Photoshop Correct. is the most direct way to animate. Like in terms, you just draw it on a with a pencil, and then you just have it's got like a timeline, so you got the next frame, and that's basically like the, all the tools are so limited. Mm-hmm. So it's not like a professional animation software, but I feel like that's all you really need. It's you really know? one step above MS Paint. Right. Well, that's what <laughs> um, Duncan, Duncan, uh, he referenced that there was this other MS Paint guy or something. Um, yeah. yeah so what's, what's that guy's name? So there's like, when, when I started animating, I was inspired heavily by Pilot Red Sun. Oh, yeah. Pilot Red Sun. Oh, yeah. And, uh, but... You know, and also there was other animators at that time too, Braxton the Porcupine, and th- these channels had never really picked up, but they're like in the same vein where they would make these really kind of like sincere but uh, poorly drawn shit posts, kind of, you know. But they were um, 
they're like almost intentionally poorly drawn because just from the fact that they are drawn that way makes it funnier. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and it wasn't YouTube. So there was, this is like after YouTube poops. So YouTube poops were like when you would like recut an episode of like King of the Hill or something or, and there was one guy that was really good at it and his name was uh, Aliantos. But I, I used to find that the majority of YouTube poops were kind of, kind of stupid like mm-hmm. they're just not good you know alianto has kind of elevated that thing a little bit and then there was this whole like yeah so back in 2016 2017 there were some youtube animators making these um i don't know what you would call them really but they were just they were, it was like taking like meme energy and, and trying to like do something a little bit more than just make memes out of them you know what i mean mm-hmm. trying to make them a little bit more artistic i guess in some ways even if no one really uh, you know saw them as being artistic because they're just um they really they're just kind of look like shit posts you put on youtube right yeah but sometimes you uh you do a shit post and then that's what people gravitate towards so you can actually feed them real art and yeah. this is something i really respect about umami <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> which is that you guys are you're like real artists you manage to like make actual art on youtube.com <laughs> yeah. without Without really, you know, I don't ever see you really handicapping yourself or pushing some sort of like uninspired algorithmic slop. There, there's a few times I definitely, you know, made something with like the algorithm in mind. But these days I, I just tend not to do that because I find it uh, not creatively fulfilling to do so. It depends. I mean, the crab doctor. One. Yeah, that's true. So recently we made one called um, uh, The Good doctor except it was crossed out the word good and we put the crab doctor <laughs> it's because on twitter this like you know that like there's like a clip from that show the good doctor yeah where, yep. like the i am a surgeon that that I mean where i'm sure anyone any viewer of this podcast will be familiar with that one but i i immediately organized the team so carolina well umami but two and umami. <laughs> there's actually three umamis. Yeah, there's a, there's yeah. a third umami. Yes, yes. So, so we got that video pumped out like in under 24 hours, I think, because I knew it was there was a limited amount of time when that video would stop trending. That whole idea, because memes don't last very long anymore. No, flash in the pan, one month max. Yeah, what, yeah. time limit. Like. And it was that's a long time, even. Yeah, a month. Yeah. A month is like grandma, grandfather. It used meme. to be like six whole months back in 2016. Back wow. in my old days. That's when time moved slower. Yeah. Yeah. Time is speeding up as we approach the Tyson Glarity. Yeah. <laughs> the thing that so that video was successful. It actually got a lot of views, more than average, because of the, you know capitalizing on, capitalizing on something that's trending, right? But um, it doesn't happen that often because I'm not usually aware of when some things are trending. And usually I, I make a meme joke right. that's like eight years past when it peaked. Yeah, and I'm analog, so I don't know what's happening. Right, yeah, you are you live an analog <laughs> life. Yeah. You don't go on, you don't you don't touch a lot of computer. Well, it's, it's really a lie, but it's, it's <laughs> like if you're going to use a computer or your phone, it's like intentional. What are you doing there? It's less just mindlessly scrolling like if i'm gonna look at memes then i'm gonna seriously look at memes yeah we had this conversation i was like how do you not look at your brick and you were like you just don't you just don't and i was like huh i never thought about it like that before <laughs> yeah. no i think it, i think it's just a, i think it's just a mentality i think it's a mindset well thing. it's a mentality and it's also just like a chemical addiction yeah right? like yeah the longer you can manage to not use it the the less your brain is going to respond to that because i used to be like legit addicted to checking my facebook right and at some point i was clocking like 14 hours a day and i'm like what the fuck am i hours? doing Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> you you well you, you're you're under 14 i'm oh, i'm no. i'm i'm averaging 15 hours screen time a day but this is facebook so yeah. like, oh, just that facebook. Facebook. That's, <laughs> that's pretty crazy that's fucked up yeah yeah so. facebook <laughs> facebook's pretty lame so where do you guys get your ideas from oh, <sighs> god damn <laughs> Man, he's been story all the bad guys. Was- <laughs> <laughs> this uh, is so hard to answer because it's really like <laughs> us sitting around and talking. All right, so I had this professor in, at NASCA at university, and uh, I remember one time okay, one of those. Your own answer. He had a source in this thing he was trying to teach us, and it was just him. <laughs> I was like, oh, that that's pretty funny. So he's like. Yeah, yeah. the The source is my brain, mm-hmm. and he would just like look at you and be like, "This is where it comes yeah. from." So, like, yeah. I mean, that's kind of where the ideas come from. I mean, they it's come from somewhere, awesome. but you know, 
That's pretty awesome. Like you like you like when a philosopher just wildly posits from their own mind instead of referencing other philosophers. Yeah, just say something. I don't, <laughs> I don't know why people are so scared to do that. Well, what is the point of philosophy if you're not thinking on your own? Yeah, just have your own idea. I think the argument is like sometimes you have an idea that feels like your own, but someone else has already expressed it. Yeah, that's fine. Most likely, someone already has too. Yeah, and in, in, if you were to like, it's you know, just not it's not recorded somewhere that you can right. And when you it. when you reference a previous philosopher, you're adding to the great interconnected work of philosophy instead of just kind of being schizophrenic in your room. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I, I, I also that's a, that's appreciate a, wild So positives. all you're saying is you need references and that will like surpass schizophrenia, basically? Well, when you reference something, you're engaging <laughs> with what other people have done yeah, instead of just mm-hmm. being alone. I mean, I'm, I, I'm predisposed towards creating my own internal framework that does not interact with, the, with other people's perspectives, but I recognize that's autistic. It's an academia psyop, to, to, yeah. to quote other people. <laughs> just have your own ideas. I don't know. I think... <laughs> I think um, I think we're coming at it from a non-academic perspective. I think no, 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 no one here is really an academic, right? No. But we're all thinkers. We all went to the same university. Well, that's oh, really? That's, yeah, yeah well, we did. Yeah. NASCAR at University of oh, Halifax. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> I didn't go to art school. Yeah, you're, the only one never, you're the only one here who doesn't have an arts degree from NASCAD University. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> Where do we go from there? Yeah. You have a journalism degree. No, I studied political science. Oh, I studied political science with a ma- with a major in mental illnesses. Okay, and um, and and internet culture. Oh yeah. Um, it's sort of the the tragedy of trying to make commentary on the internet is you have to engage with the internet. Because uh, I'll, I'll like I'll do that personally too. I'll try to not look at my phone mm-hmm. or like open Instagram for a few days, and then I just run out of ideas. Exactly. Because I'm like. You have, to, you have to look at it. You're forced to look at it and then comment on it. And then you're forced to be addicted to your phone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but there's office hours for that. Not really, though, because sometimes the best memes show up at 2 a.m. And well, then, you know. The really autistic, like, super nerds will set up scrubbers for things like yeah. this. And huh. It's true, though, because I don't want to really be participating in social media that much, to be frank. Yeah. But I have to kind of be aware of what, like, the zeitgeist yeah. is at the time because I'm commenting on it whether or not i'm i'm aware of that or not and i find the videos where i am kind of engaging with whatever is happening in some sort of period of time tend to do better like just because people are like resonating with them in some level like the covid19 video i made during the covid i mean that obviously you didn't need to be like looking at social media to experience covid19 but mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, it's it's it like it, it applies to my other videos that are not so um apparent what the theme is you know do you tiktok at all yeah i do i just basically cut up clips on my videos and just upload them you do well in the talk i don't yeah i do but and the thing is is like if it doesn't do well you can just delete it and then repost it and and you can even do like like if you get a video that gets like a million views or whatever you just delete it and then post it again and it'll also get another million or like another you know a lot right yeah no one knows it's wild no one cares either yeah because it's very fleeting program, right? It's it's, <laughs> it's it's really just there so you can be like, oh, I've seen you in a dream, yeah. you've entered, you've permeated my consciousness somehow. Yeah, jeez, man. Well, I think some of these platforms, you think you're posting like a piece of artwork that's going to be on display, mm-hmm. and then these newer platforms, it's kind of like, well, this is just an updates feed. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, people are just engaging with your art in bed at 4 a.m. Yeah. And they've been on their phone for two hours already. Mm. YouTube's a little bit more permanent, where I feel like if you upload something, you can keep it there forever. And because it's like, it displays prominently, like, when it was uploaded and stuff. And if I, like, make a change to a video, like, there's actually two different versions of the Seinfeld video I made. And people are like, they're like, ah, are you going to be like George Lucas going back and changing things? (laughs) I'm like, God damn, it's just a... People, Seinfeld people really video. like. In my experience, people really like the first edition of whatever they see. Like I made sure. songs and I put it on yeah. Patreon, and people, people like it's objectively worse, but mm-hmm. they grow to like that the original version of it over the version that I go with, even though it's objectively better. Because that's the first thing they heard. Exactly. That's yeah. how their brain. They're like, yeah. oh yeah, this is how it's supposed to be, and oh right. you've changed it. That's why people get like protective over <laughs> yeah. Star Wars. Um, all right, now I want you guys to um, break down. Interface and tell me every point of what it means. Intellectualize <laughs> it and uh, kill it. Break down what? Break, break down every part of interface. Explain it in, in, in great detail. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hate it when people ask me that stuff. I know, man. I know. But That's like, why I'm asking you. Well, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's, it's brutal. Like, I don't know, man. Like, 
Uh, sometimes I get like messages on on emails, and people want me to kind of like explain my thesis on the film. Where it's do you like, think that's coming from? Why do people want everything to be explained away? They don't want to think about it. They're uncomfortable with uh, the uncertainty. Well, some people do think about it, and they sometimes they watch like other videos on YouTube where they like break down interface, but they want to know like the right one. Yeah, mm. that's true. You it's know? like a puzzle to those people, and then there's the other spectrum of people that are just like, "This movie is hard. I don't want to think about it too much." Yeah, because like the thing is, you are dealing with themes. There are specific uh, things that you're dealing with in your work in, in art, mm -hmm. but you're also not spelling it out directly. So it's not like it's completely meaningless. It's not like just complete babble. But it's not something that you necessarily want to explain every part of, to, of it. Yeah, it's like I'm kind of like on the same page of David Lynch when he talks about explaining your own artwork. He just thinks it's he's got like a more like vitriolic like uh, kind of a he gets stance pissed. against yeah. it than I do. <laughs> right, but I think that that's probably a, that's like a fair response. Exactly. Just get angry. Yeah, just get angry. <laughs> just get angry. Just get mad. Pissed. Like, like the answer to what do you mean by this movie is a punch in the face. Exactly. Yeah. He's too calm and peaceful a man to punch someone in the face. And, but I mean, Bogart. mixed mixed in with those questions, usually there's like accusations as well. Yeah. Like uh, you know, working for I've been accused of working for aliens. Yes, he's re he's received like an eight page write up about how he's a shill for the aliens. Mm. Uh, our chat got his first schizo uh, DM, um, some guy giving you like paragraphs and paragraphs. Yeah, I get, I get those. I feel like that's just a, a sign of growth on YouTube. It is. Is, you, is. you get people who are like, this video, how did you know this about me? About, yeah. this, about my own mind. Like they think you're talking to them <laughs> right, and they yeah. leave like paragraphs and paragraphs about how you like dissected them. Yeah, I, I think I have a pretty high rate of those people for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the camera. I don't know why. <laughs> I, I, out of all of YouTube, I think we're like at that focal point that probably attracts the most amount of those kind of comments. Yeah. We've just naturally gravitated to that area because uh, we're probably also like that on some level. Yeah. We, you attract people who you're like. Yeah. Like, um, I know people who never get those comments because they make the most normie <laughs> content possible. Yeah. And they attract normies. Yeah. Yeah. So, but even then, I'm sure if you get big enough. I'm sure Mr. Beast. I think sometimes that, that happens because people are just lonely, though. Yes. I mean, you can't go fully schizo if you have a good... They're like, oh, you're like me. Finally, I found someone like me. Yeah. Yeah, you're relating to someone online because you don't have actual friends. That's, uh, that's what I hope to, to fill in people's lives. Um, like, you know, I, I encourage people to go to bed to my videos. <laughs> I mean, to some degree, why is that bad, you know? Because um, you're, like, contributing to moral and cultural and co community uh, decay, probably. <laughs> oh! <laughs> oh! <laughs> yeah. Uh, before I knew Sisyphus 55, there was a point where it seemed like he was making videos about my ideas. Mm. He made like four videos. I would like, talk about something and like two days later there'd be a video about it. I wasn't like a delusion. I was just a, a weird coincidence. Right, right, yeah. We, I, I remember that phase. Yeah. We called it keep getting sissy cucked. Sissy cucked, yeah. yeah. Like, I'm going to make this video then three days later he just makes the video. He yeah. steals it right out of your head. Yep. You know, uh, there was. I feel like there is a um, sort of like fabric of uh, I ideas that kind of flows, and then a lot of artists they tend to pick up on them at the same time. Mm. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. I do. When I was doing interface, there was like a certain painting I would make a reference to or whatever, and I I noticed that like it takes me a couple months to make a video, mm. but like while I was posting it, just a week before or after, the, like someone would make like an art critique video about that same painting that does pretty well on YouTube. So mm. it kind of like complemented my own video. Yeah. And, and it was kind of cool to see. And there was one artist um, that emailed me once and she said, someone sent me uh, this animation I did and they asked me if they used me as a reference and uh, she just wanted to clear the air with me because like... She she wanted to make it certain that I wasn't that she wasn't like copying my work or I or was I wasn't copying her work because the weird thing is she made a painting of um of this uh, guy driving a Cadillac or a Cadillac classic kind of car with three different faces and a flower in the front seat mm -hmm. which is like ex almost the exact same thing that happens in safe mode yeah and it and it came out around the same time too and it was just like. Um, and I saw her her, part, her paintings, and I thought it was uh, 
pretty awesome. But and it was weird that it just happened to be that two artists on the different sides of the world kind of made something very similar at the same time. You know? Yeah. I definitely subscribe to that. I always think like if you have a, if you have an idea that's really novel, it's like you have six weeks. And if you don't capitalize on it, someone else will take it because it's just in the zeitgeist. Like it's yeah. out there. It's kind of it's it's permeated, and someone someone will just pick it eventually. You yeah, and and, and, they'll, and, and yeah. that's all the more reason to make your art quickly while you can. Because um, I've had plenty of experiences where I have ideas and then someone else does them worse than I would do them. I think, but the cr- it crusts over. Like I had a I had a reactions channel called Reactions where I had automatically generated reactions, um, and I just like pre-record a bunch of like. <gasps> whoa weird and like that was like a year ago and now the reaction stuff is really popping off there's one guy who has an ai that like but the the problem is he did it unironically like he had an unironic like ai where he would just like react to things and it would just crank out those videos and everyone hated it because he was doing it with no self-awareness that's terrible um but like i got like two million subs i know it worked yeah um my reaction channel, on the other hand, got taken down by CGP Grey, who manually copyright struck three of my videos because I guess he doesn't like that stuff. What the? Yeah, so, um, but it, I don't know. I, I would have liked to have kept doing that, but I was eventually going to transition into um, just yelling at women on TikTok and seeing how many uh, subscribers I could get through that, but <laughs> they're like, ah! ah, just like screaming, <laughs> just like no, no, no coherent uh, reaction, but like pre-recorded like screams like, Arr! <laughs> yeah but uh, i'm just not yeah i'm not really organized enough to pull stuff like that off like when it got taken down i was like well there goes all my momentum yeah 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 and then other people did it and now it's 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 done the good thing though is i have like five ideas of that like i have like five ideas of that caliber every day so just a matter of like i'm not worried about running out of ideas um but i am worried that i'll never I'll, i won't be able to do the ones that i commit to in time right um well, who needs ideas when you can just watch other people's videos? Yeah, and react to their ideas. Move your face around. Okay, guys. Wow. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, I don't know. Um, <laughs> do you do you get people reacting to your stuff? Um, not really. We got the once we got this like sister brother pair. Oh. Uh, well, but that was like nice and wholesome. Yeah, I'm not gonna like if you're a tiny channel. I don't. I love it when it, people react. Difference. Yeah, I, I I don't really care personally. If, if I, someone, I'm not going around copyright striking any, no, anyone. Yeah, there, there's a difference between someone like genuinely trying to make a video and someone just being predatory and being like, "Oh, here's the newest movie. I'm gonna react to it and just put zero effort in like mime expressions and yeah, ranking the dollar bills." Yeah, yeah. there was a con- there was a controversy with XQC. If you know who that is. Yeah. I think uh, like last month where he was filming himself reacting live on stream and he gets up to use the bathroom mm-hmm. for like 20 minutes yeah. and then the video just plays and then he clipped that and put it on his clips channel <laughs> and that clip got like 2 million views. Yeah. And it's literally just like an empty chair in the bottom corner and the video just plays in its entirety. I mean, I feel Unironically, like... Unironically, not. It wasn't like self-aware at all. No, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. And I feel like in that case, these people really do need to start DMCAing some of these streamers, you yeah. know? I, I, you know, just the law is there to protect you as a creator. You know, use it. That's what I'm just gonna say. You, and and I, you know, probably CGP Gray, whatever. I, he's doing just the same thing, but you know, probably a little bit overly aggressive because I don't think you know. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> look, I remember looking up on Twitter afterwards, and actually, like a lot of people were like, I think he, he just copyright claimed every single one. Oh, like everyone, geez. even some arguably like fair use stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like I, I don't, I'm not actually that salty about him taking down mine. Cause like the whole point is that it's, it's like not yeah. fair use really. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I was, people were complaining that he was taking down more fair use stuff. It's kind of up to each person, I think. Yeah. Some people are going to be more relaxed than others, but you got to ask what the hell the internet is. If you're watching a guy, like not even sit in a chair <laughs> with a video playing in the background. Like what is that? And then that gets more views than the original video. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I just think I'm not that anal about it. I can't get in the headspace of like copyright striking somebody. I've done it plenty of times in the past, but not necessarily for my animations. Uh, it was we used it's, to do documentaries yeah. in the past that would cost a lot of money to film and stuff. And yes, they would just get freebooted right up on the YouTube. Yeah, uh, not YouTube, but um, f- Facebook. Oh yeah. And Facebook actually, p- there was a time when Facebook pages were making a lot of money, 
just from bringing in viewers and right. stuff. Right, you have a, you guys had a second channel, and yeah. that, that, that would get freebooted a lot on Facebook, oh, yeah. right? So just posting your work in its entirety. Exactly. Just it, oh, yeah. no credit. Yeah, that's different. Yeah. We, we have, like, one documentary we spent six months making, and it has, like, a person we signed forms for that we're going to pre- protect his identity because it's his work mm. and his image, and it's like you have Chinese companies just freebooting the content, literally cutting him out and... Putting stuff like, oh, this is our factory. This wow. is how we do this. Yeah. Like, it's just really obscene level it, of... It would bug me It would bug me a lot when I was less known. Um, I would make memes when I was, like, 19. They, they would they would do very well. But And I'd put my watermark on. I'm just like, please view my Facebook page. Because I was, I, was, I was posting on Facebook. <laughs> yeah. I was, like, a meme maker on Facebook. Mm-hmm. And I'd had 500 likes on my Facebook page. And I thought it was a big deal. Right. Yeah, of course. Um, but yeah, people would like take my watermark out, put their own watermark in. I'd like manually like DMCA them. It the would memes. be like, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, I know. Yeah, because I was like, <laughs> I was like, well, I was like, I because I wanted to make it as an artist so bad, right? Yeah, and I had nothing, mm-hmm. and then then people would take it and they would get the views. Yeah, you know what though? I, I love my fans because sometimes when people freeboot my animations now in the comments, the top comments are always like, "Why did you steal this from Umami?" <laughs> the fuck is the matter with you? Yeah, and then it's like they're tagging me and stuff, and I'm just like, that's cool, man. And then like they're all just like, <laughs> I, so I, get, I get tagged. <laughs> I get tagged in that in in the sense that people are like, this guy stole your idea, and I watch. I'm like, no, he didn't. <laughs> yeah. 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 Do you ever um, has there been any that like re- really pissed you off when they take it when they steal your idea or they steal they use your work? Uh, actually, no. I mean, well. Because it actually hasn't really happened that often, so the, and the only the only time it really kind of annoyed me was when it was just clearly a, a an Instagram channel that just like steals videos, yeah, and that's and then no credit, but like and then then uh, you can like they also have like sponsored posts, you know what I mean? Mm. So they're like making mo- money off of stealing videos. And in that case, I, I I I there are cases where I can tell when someone is inspired by what I've done or when they're directly like. They've learned something from what I've done because they'll make the same error that I made. Like I'll, I'll I've, I used to crank out all kinds of misinformation. Used to, <laughs> not anymore, of course. <laughs> but like I would talk about something like Pasadism or whatever. I would say it. I'd say like Pasadism, and then I would like reference something that doesn't actually exist. And then people would be like, "Oh yeah, Pasadism is when this and that and blah blah blah." And they'd like reference the exact same thing I said, and they make the same mistake that I made. And I was like, "Okay, this person learned from me." Or they'll use certain terms that only I use. Like they'll say like. Uh, like the cultural left or the cultural right or something. I'm like, right. yeah, I, I was like, or like post irony, meta irony. Mm-hmm. Um, or there's like a case where like iDubs uh, used my model of irony. Oh, um, right. I mean, and, it's a pretty good theory, so. Yeah, but like, uh, <laughs> and it's not like it's my model of irony. It's just like, that's something that uh, I put together and I, it was clear that he had seen that or someone had seen that and told him about it mm-hmm. or whatever. And like, that's fine. That's kind of just how ideas spread. You had no comeuppance on that, did you? Did he like ever? No. That's yeah. Classic guy dubs. I mean, I, I really don't care. <laughs> but I, uh, yeah, it's fine. I, th- I think I think the vast majority, like I think people mostly get it, and if they don't get it, they'll like they'll like they'll find a way. Like I think a lot. I think a lot of people like recognize that that there's like a sort of growth of those ideas, and some people will like track it back. And I got referenced in like a an academic paper on it and like they referenced all the different like models of irony or something there you go so you you you, you cited yourself now you're a source i think on nascap means... they call that discourse i did i did i did cite <laughs> other well i cited other people in that video as well i cited the philosopher's meme and i was ex- explicitly saying that like the post irony meta irony model came from them <laughs> how'd you how'd you guys meet yeah i want like a, i want like a lovey dovey story i want to inspire the we met at nascad yeah nascad yeah. Yeah. Give me give me a, a play by play. Uh, and and before you do this, let me just say whenever <laughs> whenever there's like a, a creative duo and they've known each other for like a really long time, especially if it's a romantic duo, I just, I'm seething. I'm constantly seething because I'm a I'm a solo yeah, artist. You're so jealous. Yeah. Look so I'm, I'm, I'll it's just like see red you. and yeah. green. I'll just see that here. <laughs> red and green. Uh, you actually want to know? Um, sh- uh, can I tell a story about the leg? Leg. Sure. Go ahead. Okay. Well. Very romantic. She, uh, Carolina had like a, a messed up leg. I and still have a messed up leg. It didn't heal. It's well, it's partially got fixed now. I'm a cyborg. So she, <laughs> yeah, she had a surgery to fix it. But, but I remember uh, she was standing in front of me at, at the uh, cafeteria at the. I'm just trying to pick head, a sandwich. And I said, what "The fuck's wrong with your leg?" 
<laughs> just, like, He's not joking. Yeah. It was your first interaction? Yes, he was standing I, like behind just me. Just like right a stranger. Here, and I'm like, in I, my ear. And I'm like, what the fuck? I, I don't know, like, uh, I don't know like what was wrong with me because like, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> then I felt so bad that I said that that I like I was like oh that girl's in my class oh you guys are like twenty yeah, I was like I was an eighteen I think I oh, was, wow. yeah I don't think I even I don't think I swear I think I said just well, like what's wrong with your leg and yeah I, like, you were just like, very blunt and loud it and, was rarely but then I was like oh, all right aware. I gotta sit next to her to like make sure she knows I'm not just some jackass you know mm. what I mean yeah. And then I ended up liking her, so. <laughs> oh, ended up liking me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then re- the rest is history. Well, yeah, we well. were in a, do you know Craig from the video department? Craig from the video department. The, the eyebrow guy? Uh, the eyebrow guy, yes. Just yeah. say yes. <laughs> yes. I, I have no idea. We'll just go with the eyebrow guy. <laughs> yeah, anyway, is. there was a guy that taught like a, all the new media classes and stuff. And um, part of our new media was like doing show and tells, basically like it's school all over again, yeah. like elementary school. And it's like bringing some personal stuff, and he's bringing in all this like hot dog videos and like his briefcase with a banana and stuff. For some reason, this was attractive. Oh uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> she got all the ladies. A briefcase excited. with a banana. Yeah, yeah, it had like crackers in it too. It's like you know. Take note, yeah. incels. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, like a like a, like a physical briefcase with a banana and crackers inside of it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, why, I'm not joking. Why did you have that? Because uh, it's weird. Because I don't know. Like, I, like what else? Be, why am I having show and tell in university? You know what I mean? Like, I kind of just kind of had to make fun of it. It was a, a weird bit. class <laughs> because it like basically <laughs> staged dates for you. Like, having to do a show and tell is like being purposely vulnerable in front of a room. Yeah. And then we had like wheel field trips where we like had to take photos on like train tracks and. There's always someone in art school that like shows too much, and mm. I know it's show and tell. But sometimes I didn't ask. <laughs> you know I mean? oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like, here's a video of me in a cage whipping my penis around and like yelling. It's like, ah, fuck! Now that I know what that guy's class. balls look like. <laughs> and it's been like 14 hours since right. I started class. Yeah, that, uh, art, art school is inherently romantic. It's very romantic. It's yeah, yeah. I like how you said that right after I talk about some guy whipping his balls <laughs> around in a cage. Oh, well, maybe that. Maybe I don't know. Maybe <laughs> maybe he found that. a mate. I remember I had, I had a guy who um, <laughs> we were doing a drawing class, and the project was foreshortening. You had to do like very perspective. Right. So like you do a drawing where you're pointing at the audience, at the, at the viewer, and like your finger is like half the frame. Mm. It's like all foreshortened. He did it with his dick. <laughs> oh. So his dick is oh, like no. huge. Oh. Like foreshortened, like wide angle lens. So his <laughs> cock looks like it's massive. That's and pretty, his body's behind it. I it was like really that. funny, actually. It, I, was, it was well done. I, I, <laughs> I, it was funny. I, I can appreciate that. <laughs> Who did he point it at? Like it was like the, the tip of his penis was the front of the, like that's what you're looking at. Oh, and I the see. drawing. Oh, I see. And then his body's behind it, like so, so wide angle. Mm. Yeah, I mean, if you got that as a dick pic, that's original enough to get people interested. Well, <laughs> U- U- Umami One can get away with being a wacky guy. Look at him. That that that's that, that that's He's the so that's wacky. The, that's the that's the fundamental thing. You can't get away with that shit if you're a four. Yeah. <laughs> okay. so, oh yes. Can I can I interest you guys in a Zonic? Sure, I'll have a Zonic. Uh, this might actually be way too much nicotine, though. Last last time, last time we gave one dime uh, four milligrams, and he had a panic attack, and uh, you know what, and I, was like sick. I, yeah. uh, um, last time I had a cigar, I vomited for three hours. Okay. so I will pass. Okay, you know what? You guys should take half of this gum, half of this gum each. Is that like pre-chewed gum? No. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it so lumpy? <laughs> There's a regular piece of gum in there. There's, uh, uh, actually, they're all kind of bitten. Okay, I don't. I don't. To you. <laughs> wait, wait, no, no this. this <laughs> This one's just cut in half with a knife. I see. So you can each take a half of that, and it's, it'll be one milligram. It's perfectly normal to cut gum in half <laughs> with a knife. Yeah, you, you do it. You be the guinea pig. Come on. No, take no. the gum. Eat the bugs. It's okay. I'm, I'm trying to be <laughs> Oh, wait. The, gu- the gum on the podcast. We forgot. Yeah, just, just park it in your mouth. Park it in oh, your mouth. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. We, a- we've had some complaints about chewing uh, gum on the podcast, and I think it's funny. But, but, <laughs> but Brogan thinks it's... Uh, <laughs> Bad. It's funny for twenty people and drinking, and and we'll never grow. We'll ne- the audience will never get bigger than that. And those people, yeah, yeah. Chewing this, gum on the podcast. This, this is why I need Brogan in my life because he'll he'll deautismify my my want to make things obnoxious. Obnoxious. Yeah. <laughs> my God, you know, my grandfather was a judge on the uh, Grants Council, 
Like he would, he would, he would give grants. He would decide who gave grants. And he was doing it for the fashion department, or he was doing it for a fashion show. It wasn't like associated with art school. And a woman walked out on the catwalk and then just pissed in a bucket. And that was the that was her whole thing. And my grandfather's like eighty years old, has a PhD. I'm not really and following where the stories come from. No, he was he was just appalled. <laughs> art school. Yeah. Right. Art, yeah, art, I art school art school adjacent chaos. Okay. Yeah. Just pissed in a bucket and he like he won't stop talking about it. This is like fifteen years ago. He right. still brings it up. As like a representation of like how the, fallen how art has fallen. How the West has fallen. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then and then you're picking up right where he left off with your videos. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Cut from the same cloth. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's um our chat our chat's been blowing up recently with his uh, decline of the West videos. It was just one decline of the West video. Oh, they're, they're kind of all vaguely decline of the West. <sighs> that one's the one video that got recommended to me organically. Oh yeah. Yeah. The cause video. Mm-hmm. Oh wow. Yeah, I actually I, I I I was aware of cause before, but I didn't realize how offensive it was until after I saw your video. I actually really don't like it. No, cause. Yeah. Wow. Look at you. Yeah. Influencing. Influencing. He it's basically it's a influencer. gift shop scam. It's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> and who's that guy that the Coons? Not the Coons. Is the guy that makes those like uh, Co- uh, inflatable uh, balloons? Of Jeff the, Coons. Jeff Coons. Right. Yeah. Mm. Same sort of thing. Yeah. If you can go, you can go to like the the MoMA in New York and buy mm. Jeff Coons sculptures in the gift shop. And they're like, and they'll grand. be like numbered like one of three hundred mm-hmm. plates. That they sell in the gift shop, like all the art books, all the artist monographs, and then like a four thousand dollar plate yeah. you can buy. That's an actual original Jeff Koons work. I think these people are being ripped off by these galleries because that's just not going to be worth anything in 20, 50, 60 years. I don't think so hmm. because they're going to recognize it as those gift shop art pieces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. not those the are, actual. It, oh, it's yeah. really weird how like these gift shops are like turning stuff that's supposed to be fine art or like master mastery or like. Uh, you know, high art and turning into kitsch, basically. Mm. So it's like everything has a Van Gogh print on it now. Like you can get like Van Gogh toilet paper. Mm. Like what does that do to the person's work? I don't know. I it's, don't think we know. Yeah, it's really strange. I don't know. I don't. I don't even know what to make out of it. Mm. Honestly, the kitschification of art. Yeah, because mm. it is like it is everything. The socks, the puzzles. Yeah. Literally everything. Yeah. Shirts for old ladies. Well, that was the thing at the Cause Gallery is that Cause is really big in like hype beast sneaker culture. And if you go to the gift shop at the AGO, there was Cause t-shirts that were like retail price Cause t-shirts and they were all gone because you can like literally buy the t-shirt and then go down the street to a sneaker store and sell it for 80 bucks. Mm -hmm. So all the all the shirts were gone. It's like everyone was just going. People were coming in, going to the gift shop, buying a Cause shirt and leaving. I think a lot of these institutions are doing a lot worse than it seems. And so that's why you may be seeing an influx of this kind of like gift shop sort of stuff happening. Yeah. Like I, I feel like you know it's like it's like with colleges importing uh, foreign students and stuff to prop up the their existence. It's because it's it's like demonstrating that they're actually um, like their balance books like they're sh- they're like on the decline a little bit, and so they're gonna have Balancing to resort their ledger. They have to re- like to resort to these more like money grubbing kind of techniques of yeah. You know what I mean? Well, U of T owns like all of Yorkville, basically all the property there. Mm. So if you, yeah, you go like Bloor and Young, there's like the Gucci store, the St. Laurent store, like all the designer stores in Toronto. And then University of Toronto owns the buildings that all those stores are in. Mm. It's like the majority of their net worth as an institution is wrapped up in property that is designer stores. <laughs> it's crazy. What are you going to do about that, though? Capital infiltrates everything. Well, I, I don't know what I'm going to do about it. What are you going to do? How what are you going to change the world? I just think it's a thing to point out. Yeah, I'm, 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 is, just, gonna, it, I'm just gonna is, notice it. it, it just, <laughs> I'm just gonna notice. This guy's it. got a master's degree in naming and noticing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I find it interesting that you describe yourself as a cyborg because you, your own personal art, deals with themes of kind of transhumanism in the future. Uh, it also deals with here's a magpie building a nest. Um, yeah, is that like related? No, this is like something I've had a hard time with the entire time I've been making art, which is about 20 years now. It's like I will paint everything and anything from your grandma's cat to like erotica. Mm. So like at at some point I was like, I need to have at least something that is going to be like an art series that is personal to me that is worth something to culture also. Mm. And one of my perspectives that I'm granted thanks to my health is 
having way too many surgeries and having a hip replacement. And people have this fantasy that in the future, it's like, well, it doesn't matter what we do with ourselves. Like, we can just fix ourselves and we can just make ourselves better. But it's like, just look at your phone and, like, how glitchy it is. And, right. And, um, like, my hip replacement, for example, it's like you think you get that once in your lifetime and you're good. And actually, it's, I mean, the, the new ones are much better, but it used to be that you'd have to get a new one every 10 years. So every 10 years, you'd have a major surgery. Yeah. And most people are uncomfortable to even go to the doctor for, like, regular checkups. So yeah. think of, like, a major invasive surgery where you have to sign a waiver that you might die. Yeah. And then, what, like, a year of recovery? <laughs> um. Yeah, it depends on the person. If you're, like, in super bad shape, it could possibly even make you more disabled. Like, I'm in really good shape, so I recovered in, like, three, four months. But older people, like... Older people, I'm discovering, even have this problem where their bones don't heal when they're older. Jeez. Yeah, like, you get to, like, 80 or something, and your bones just, like, like uh, that's it. Like, you break a bone, it's just broken forever. Yeah, like, they can glue it together, but, like, yeah, that's it. There, there is a limit to being a human being, and you can't just fix everything with technology, and it's... it's not with uh, that attitude. Not with that attitude, Just drink more milk. What's the problem? Yeah. Thanks. You, you, guys getting, you guys getting that chip brain, the brain chip? Uh, that's one of those ideas right it's like can you imagine that being plugged in and for one you're probably gonna get ad search served to it for sure 100 mm. <laughs> percent. and then it's like fucking glitching out like like you're trying to like use your arm and it's just like s spinning around or something or and there's no right to repair on your arm so you have to like go into the store and they can like gouge you for like $10, i mean I, I know what it's designed for right now which is to help with like treating paralysis which is a noble yeah. thing. I'm, I'm for it, actually. Yeah, because yeah. of that. Because there's some people out here that are like actually quadriplegic and stuff. And yes, they could definitely use some. That's why. I, that's why I don't see any good moral arguments against transhumanism. But I also think like once the, that it's kind of a modern Bailey. Like you, you start with, um, oh, this guy doesn't have an arm. What you don't want him to have an arm, you monster. But then he has four arms, and then the baseline is now four arms for your Amazon warehouse job because you can pack twice as quickly. Exactly. Yeah. Right, and it's also like, well, if he doesn't have an arm, but it's like, what's wrong with that? You, do you have to have two arms? Yeah, like there's, you could be a person with one arm and still be a person. So there's a lot of gray room there, and, and it's I'm not really like taking a side, but it's been more interesting to think about how it's not going to be good than how it is going to be good because it's so easy to be like, no, yeah, right. I'm going to be so awesome. It's going to be good. It's going to be better. He's, than... He's just going to turn himself into a Terminator. It, listen, apparently, <laughs> there's people out there that have a locked in syndrome. You yeah, imagine that's what terrible. kind of a nightmare that is. Yeah. You can't even move your eyes or anything. And like, just if they can just like hook you up so that you can communicate with the person that's in there, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like, that would be that's just worth it in my opinion, even mm. despite all the negatives that could come with it in the future. Mm. Just being able to connect with those people that are like really suffering right now. Transhumami. Well, the anti-capitalist <laughs> argument. So Francis Fukuyama wrote the book The End of History, and it's like him in the late '90s, and he, and he posits that liberal democracy, like all countries, will eventually become liberal democracies, right? Like the USSR versus US was the last kind of big ideological war we'll ever face. And history is just going to slowly march towards a point where we're all the same system. And he came back on that because of transhumanism. He said the new struggle will be, because they'll implement this technology where like, okay, a guy has his arms paralyzed and he's going to get like funding and he gets a new arm and it's a good health benefit. And then rich people are just going to like pay for it to get new arms, but they, even though they don't need new arms or they need like new limbs or whatever. Yeah, exactly. to improve their mobility and it's going to it's going to create a new class of people who have the money to just like modify themselves versus those who don't. Exactly. I'm going to get a second robot dick. Second robot dick. Yeah. For Swap typing. Out. Extendable. Extendable. Different <laughs> colors and shapes. Yeah. Spinnable. Spinnable. <laughs> 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 like a God. blender. Shoots off like a missile. <laughs> I, I could like I could like turn off my phone's ringer from here just like <laughs> Get to do it. With your dick. Scroll on TikTok yeah. for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's interesting. I bring this up because you guys both deal with it in your work. True. He, do it, he yeah. deals with it differently. I, and I deal with it more on a psychological uh, oh, point yeah? of view. Yeah. It's because the interface is about, like, you know. He's explaining. It. He's explaining. It. Everyone. Well, <laughs> there, you caught me. <laughs> well, but I, I was going to say is like one of the themes. Like I think I I don't have any problems because I'm like you. I don't like explaining everything. Right. But I do. I'm I have no problem talking about the themes that I'm exploring and the mm -hmm. ideas I'm playing with. And that's one of the ideas you're playing with. Yeah. Well, one of the ideas is that maybe 
it being the opposite way around or rather rather than replacing body parts you're replacing the one thing that we don't have a physical representation of which is maybe our soul and that going into a machine it's the thing is we don't actually can't really prove that we even have something that could be considered a soul or whether or not it's just a chemical orientation of our brain cells that make up our memories but if you were to like recreate those memories in sort of some sort of digital environment maybe you could recover whatever it is that was a soul into a computer mm. and if you give that like those memories and stuff the ability to operate independently how much different is that from the actual person we don't really know because if a soul doesn't really exist and we're just a collective embodiment of memories and experiences and what is the difference it's very you can existential about you, you you can you can upload your soul to a machine i'm just gonna smash with a brick yeah <laughs> i'm a i'm a tie-hard robophobe <laughs> yeah. well, it's like that uh think of like a thought experiment where it's like the kind of cartoon trope of like switching brains with somebody and yes. when you really just think about that it's like what are you switching like what would it, what would it be like to be me but then be also be greg right right where i'm like I have I have myself and my conscious awareness of the fact that I am Greg, but then I have Greg's mannerisms and body. So like, what is me and what is you? Like, if we switch, how is that? How would that work, right? Doesn't that give birth to a new human? <laughs> no. I, I guess it's like it's like you, you, we imagine ourselves as having like a, a self awareness, <laughs> right? Like a, like a viewer that's separate from like our actions mm -hmm. and our our mannerisms and our body and everything. Yeah, and that's like a. I guess it's like yeah, duality versus. Oh, we we have we have hive minds all the time without technology. I mean, look. We've got umami, the, the 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 group. Exactly, <laughs> the unit. The unit of umami. Our brains have been merged. Why haven't you guys killed each other yet? Um, we normally ask why you haven't <laughs> killed yourself, but we're we're right. switching it up for this one. We have a couple episodes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Because it's illegal. Yeah. <laughs> if it wasn't illegal. What? <laughs> okay. Why haven't you guys killed yourselves yet? Well, see, that's like I said, we're merged, right? If I killed myself, then right. Carolina would have to go, too. Okay. Can't be responsible yeah, peace for that, goes. So. Huh, interesting. <laughs> yeah. You're looting for each other. Yeah. Interesting. I guess. That's beautiful. What do you, th what do you, th what's your answer? <laughs> I don't know. Huh. This is what therapy's for, I guess. Hmm. It's a big black hole over here. Yeah. yeah. We might as well, we might as well be therapy. Yeah, we're like YouTuber therapy. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Have you done many psychedelics? Uh-oh. 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 Veer, veer. Here we go. Veer. Yeah, I have, yes, of yeah. course. Yeah. Uh, marijuana and shrooms. Yeah. Okay. I feel like, yeah, when you, when you start thinking about the, uh, it's kind of like, it's like, it's, like a, it's like a meditation speed run, right? Yeah. You take, you take shrooms and you just skip like 10 years of meditation. Yeah, Because when, when you start thinking yeah. about like the self and like what the self is and like what the viewer is and duality versus like singularity in the body right it's like it's kind of just that's like natural with shrooms with psychedelics you just kind of always end up on those thoughts yeah you can't really avoid them but i would say there's still a difference between meditating and shrooms one you have more control over what you're doing yeah and your awareness and the other one you're just kind of like the visitor yeah and if you can even do both at the same time then you're like at another level what what do you make of uh like oh this guy must have been high to make this though like that's pretty annoying. Yeah. I mean, like when I made Interface and stuff, I never took psychedelics. Yeah. It's just, um, it's almost like something that you do after you create something, you know, so you can just decipher it. Reflect on it. You know, because especially when I'm like composing a, an album or, of music, sometimes it's nice to take some, like, like a gram of shrooms yeah. and listen to it. You know what I mean? Yeah. But um, sometimes I question whether or not those those ideas that you get from taking shrooms, like, you know, the unity and all that, if it's actually true or if it's just some sort of, like, base template that your brain defaults to when you're taking that sort of thing, just to kind of, like, appease you a little bit. Or I don't know if necessarily what it's telling you is, like, a universal truth or if it's just, like, some sort of, like, that's the universal truth that your brain chemistry is made up to tell you. You know what I mean? Yeah. Does that make sense? No. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of confusing. Well, I don't know. I've never I've never done a drug in my life, so I can't uh, I can't really. Yeah, whatever, man. Yeah. Uh the, the pure the, you know, the conspiracy argument would be that psilocybin's a poison and that shrooms are trying to cultivate us as a as a as a species oh, yeah. and we're below them and that the kind of um 
the anti-individualism you get from doing mushrooms is actually a detriment to the human race. Right. Because we'll stop progressing, we'll stop doing things, we'll stop mastering mm-hmm. the world, and then yeah. eventually just die out as hippies, and the shrooms will take over. That's an interesting idea, I actually. mean, fungus has and been I, around much longer than anything on this planet, so it's possible it knows how to do that. And it's all connected. Yeah. Like, there's a, there's a fungus, you, I don't know where it is, I forget, but it's like the size of Texas. It's like mm-hmm. one... Mycelium? Yeah. yeah. It's all connected underneath. I think it's an organ... I might be wrong. Maybe they're trying to, like, they're making us, they want us to be a moldy. organism. You know what I mean? They want us to be moldy? Yeah, they're like, why don't you be moldy with me? You know, if Pretty you, um, some people can't clear shrooms out of their body well enough, and if it's, like, moldy, then it, like, stays in their blood, and oh. they're, like, permanently psychotic. That's that's not nice. Some good news. <laughs> I saw a video of a guy actually who was stuck in the trip. He said it's the best thing that ever happened to him. Now so he was, like, suicidal for months, and now, and now he just, like, lives in bliss constantly. Like, he just wow. cries tears of joy whenever he sees his mother. Uh, yeah, yeah, that sounds like not fun, honestly. I think, I think it, he got used I believe, to it. I believe they call that schizophrenia as well. <laughs> yeah, or manic depression. It depends what level he's at, you know. If it's like anything more than that, then it would be a nightmare. There's um, there's a graph I quite like. It has autism versus schizophrenia. It's a part of a study, 2013 graph. study. But then there's like high, there's like cognitive control. That's like the main thing. You can have like high cognitive control and be schizotypal, yeah. and then you're like a high functioning creative. But if you have low cognitive control and you're like schizotypal, then you're like just schizophrenic and mm. you can't help but make these lateral connections. That's what like meditation helps you do is like helps increase your cognitive control. Yeah. I think that's what most of mental illnesses is like how much control you maintain and how aware of what is going on you are. Yeah. Yeah. Like BPD would be low cognitive control. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And high autism. Well, it, with not everything is autism and schizophrenia. As a, as autism a isn't like a final destination. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the singularity. <laughs> but you could, you could imagine someone who is defaults to BPD, who feels <laughs> something, who feels emotions very intently, um, but also remains highly in cognitive control. And so, like a BPD person with low cognitive control is just flipping out on you. A high cognitive control BPD person feels it but manages to control themselves and then they don't have BPD anymore because they because they're no longer the only purpose of getting a, a diagnosis is so that you can get treatment for it if you don't need treatment for it if it works for you yeah that's why a lot of the most successful people are like hypomanic like they technically are like always on in a, kind of like a worrying or an unhealthy way yeah. but it's it helps them get like it's so engaged and make a lot of money that it doesn't end up being like a mental illness because they never get diagnosed because it's not a problem for them mm. So I, I would say like I'm I'm what's I'm somewhat schizotypal, but I don't need to take antipsychotics. I have my own ways of dealing with it. You once explained something that really changed my view of the world. Um, you were talking about the ocean, like the big five personalities. Yeah. Right. And you said that extremes and all of the big five personalities are considered a mental illness. Yeah. Except for extreme agreeableness. Agreeableness, because agree if you're really for high some in reason. if you're really high in agreeableness, then you're not bothering people. <laughs> like yeah. you get diagnosed when you start bothering people. This cause a schizophrenic gets thrown a psych ward fundamentally because he's bothering people. True. Yeah. I don't really know like, if that's true actually. No. I think agreeableness and agreeableness that's to that level, I I'm not sure what you call it, but it does fall into some level of mental illness. It's like being so passive that I've seen it described inside of narcissism where it's like you delete yourself to a point. You're like, you don't exist. So you're just like trying to live through everybody else. Yeah. Like, but, but that agreeable. But the, the, so, the, so the question is not that if it's objectively a mental illness, but if you will get diagnosed for anything. And there's no... There's, Probably we not. We don't have words for it. Yeah. yeah. yeah like, the, like high agreeableness, like you would do well so as like, a middle manager. Unless you went to like... The psychiatrist yourself, and he's like, yeah, "My life is a garbage fire, but, but, and I don't know why." Yeah, yeah, but then they like, there's no word for it. Like Not they wouldn't really. be like, because like if you were really high in disagreeableness, they would say you have antisocial personality right. disorder. Mm-hmm. They'd say you're a sociopath, yeah. and then you would work on becoming more agreeable and doing nice things for others people. Uh, if you were like overly high in openness, you're schizophrenic. If you're overly low in openness, you're like autistic. If you're overly high in conscientiousness, you probably have like OCD. Uh, if you're very low in conscientiousness, you don't have a job. You probably have like. <laughs> You know, like <laughs> you <have> a job <laughs> <is a> crime. <laughs> Depre- depression. You're just like yeah, depression, like being a failure, blah blah blah. So like all of these things manifest as mental illness, and they have DSM five associations with them. For agreeableness, like the closest thing you could maybe say is like uh, maybe like a codependent. Mm-hmm. Probably that would be a good one. Yeah. Although now I feel like looking this up later. You you guys are both what INTJ, right? I am. <clears throat> he I, I've done a test along in high school, and I was INTP. Okay, yeah, you you struck me more as an INTX. 
Yeah. You're like more in the middle. It's less. It's but you're. I think you're pretty clearly an INTJ. I am like, I just for fun. I've taken that test every year. Uh huh. On different platforms, and I've taken the official one, and it's like. I've never scored so high for something so consistently in my life. <laughs> and I try to I try to do a drunk or high just to skew the results and it's like still the same thing. Yeah. I, I got INFJ once. Oh, interesting. When I was lying. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so that's fun. That's fun. I wonder if I uh if I look up umami on the personality website what it'll pop up it'd be really fun to see what other people have okay to say. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna look it up someone showed me that before actually and i'm pretty sure it said intp i would which i was surprised that they knew that much about me in my uh, in my obsession with this stuff as a hobby as a hobby i would probably type you as that because i think some people take this shit way too seriously yeah also. there was a I, I researched it after high school and i got into it for a bit and then i realized especially the f- people on forums the problem is i feel like a lot of these like Myers Briggs uh, results end up being um, like self fulfilling prophecies once yep. people discover who yeah. they are or it's what like, they initially I'm so test evil. As. It's almost <laughs> like they're like, oh, I'm a cancer or whatever. I'm a Leo. So, and then they start acting or they pretend to act or they think they can act the way that they're supposed to, you know, and it's not actually true. I think the worst version of it I've seen is like introverts and like the thinking types using it as excuse for like having really bad social skills and why they don't meet anybody. Yeah, oh that's yeah, a really like an epidemic. That's I not a personality that. type. Okay, it's it's a problem that you have. I get physically ill when I see memes of people like my perfect Friday night and it's like ice cream in a bed. Just and me. like scrolling on TikTok. <laughs> I'm, I'm alone. Like, it won't be your perfect night if that's every night for the rest of your life. But they want to be. be. It's their personality type. Oh, God. They found out their Myers-Briggs too young. I found out my astrology too young. I found out I was... In, I, I didn't know what it was, but I like, figured I was an Aries when I was like seven. And I feel like yeah. that that dictated too much of my personality how growing did, up. How did that destroy your childhood? <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm an Aries. I found out I'm a Cancer, and it like made me angry. Because it's like, you are motherly. I'm like, what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> what the fuck does that mean? I'm like 18. I'm not motherly. <laughs> Oh my god! Mm. Yeah, I didn't know this personality database thing existed until he showed me. And it's it just, it's 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 quite interesting because people like speculate, uh, and like yeah, you can tell kind of that. I mean, I think if I was just watching your content, I would like int for sure. Yeah, it's definitely thinking content. It's it's, it's in the it's, bathroom. Well, it's it's thinky, but like I, what I like about what I like about you <laughs> is you um you don't <laughs> overthink, and that's what you said on Bufferfest stage, and you yeah. said it very succinctly. He overthinks in the background. I'm going to overthink it now, but if I were to repeat what I said was uh, overthinking doesn't lead to better outcomes, especially when it comes to art. Yeah, oh, you're yeah? T- you talking about that in terms of the uh, the Tyson animations you did. Right. S- the, some, of the, some of the dialogue you just kind of like... I just like thought, like, I'm going to write the dumbest thing that comes to my mind that makes me laugh. And it, for some reason, it was the thought of like cutting up those lead vests that you get at the dentist <laughs> before they take your x-ray. And then what made me laugh about it was that it's like one of those things you never think about ever, <laughs> except yeah. for like the moment that you're doing it, right? Yeah. And then uh, lead poisoning. So obviously, the connection there is Excuse just me. hilarious. Right. Cutting it up <laughs> and putting it in the water supply yeah. of Flint, Michigan, specifically. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you were saying that in the context of trying to make art, and I don't think art is, like, a thing you can think about 100%. Like, there's a point you have to let go. Oh, Brogan loves thinking about art. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. When you're making it, though, or th- or thinking about stuff that's already made, a little bit different, I guess. Yeah. Thinking about it after is different than thinking about it while you're making it. Yeah, you. De- I think I think anyone who's tried to make art has has been there in terms of... Uh, overthinking what they're doing and deconstructing it and losing yeah. it loses all meaning. Yeah, I, that's why I dropped out of grad school. Yeah. Yeah, I got so depressed. I was like miserably depressed painting. And Honestly, like, after I graduated, I couldn't paint for a while because like the the whole atmosphere of art school, it just made you like go into that headspace so much that it was paralyzing. I was like, it's not worth painting anything. Everything's been done. Everything's worthless. Like, yeah. what's the point of painting people again? What's the point of painting like nature it's been done a trillion times yeah i i think that's a common story i hear people post art school yeah i actually most people i know i graduated with don't paint anymore yeah they either they either never paint again or they find it somehow yeah they get out of the darkness 
There's there is a there is a darkness. I we had a great discussion on the last episode with a guy plastic pills. He's a critical like he's a PhD mm-hmm. critical theory. Like all he he's a he's a prof too. Like he's really really into this. And I I kept asking him like, what's the point of all this? Like critical theory. I'm like, what what's it good for? What's you know? And his answer was like, I just like reading and talking. And I'm like, that's a great answer. That's the best. That's, that's the best answer you could give on why you do something. Yeah, yeah, I mean, if you enjoy thinking about something, criticizing it, and taking it apart, that's fine. But like, yeah, just a genuine kind of light enjoyment of it, not looking, not pretending it's super serious. And that that's kind of his mode of being. And I think with art too, that helped me a lot. Yeah, was just going to like, I like painting. Full stop. Same. Yeah, I was like, I like the process of this. It's fun it's sometimes. Fun. <laughs> Someone um, has rated all of the interface characters in oh, terms yeah. of Myers Briggs. Mischief is an ENTP. Probably. Uh, say, and the right reasoning is all scary clowns are ENTP. Mm-hmm. It is known. It's the, it's the archetype for clown. And then they put Henrik down as an ISFJ, which is the opposite type. I don't know about that one. I don't know if you know enough about that. It's more like your dad. I think he's probably more like ISFX. Yeah. I don't think he like judges man. too hard, especially after all that he's been through. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> we bring this up so much. We should do a podcast episode when Frank James comes. We will. And the whole thing is just him. Like we don't even talk. Like it's like a, just a lecture <laughs> for two hours where he just explains everything. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. He. Yeah. He's um. He, yeah. We, we should do that. He's he's not he's not necessarily the most succinct when it comes to that. He can he can kind of uh, no. But it's hard. It's like a it's it's a framework for, um, it's like a framework. To sh- it's like a party trick framework, and it's fun. It's it, I, f- I find it works best when you're a really extreme example of your type. Yeah. yeah. Um, and when you're when you're less extreme, it's less fun because it's more ambiguous. Um, I mean, I mostly use it as a helpful thing. You know, it's like when you meet people, it's so much easier to have some basic idea of what they're gonna be like, and like which people you're not gonna get along with. Right. And then you can look at stuff like, oh, well, if these are my strengths, then these are probably my weaknesses. So this is shit I should probably work on. <laughs> right. Yeah. If you have that humility and if you're like the typical INTJ on the forum, you're like, I am the greatest, the smartest well, and the most capable. There's I'm just perfect. Right. Well, the, the weak <laughs> the weak function of the uh, the INTJ is called extroverted sensing. Yep. Which is how you deal with the outside world, how you, with you deal with like individuals as people as, as they are instead of trying to categorize them into something. So, like, the Myers-Briggs framework is a way of categorizing sensory information in a comprehensible way to you. But your frame of the world impacts your perce- like how the world is to you. So, like, that's why there's a, there's a rightful apprehension from frameworks like that. It's also, it's also like, a, just like, um, you know how, like, some people are super good at, like, running or, like, baseball and stuff? That's yeah. definitely another like side of that weakness. Yes. Or for for my personal example, this week is just uh, you know, you're, I'm really bad at taking care of myself, mm-hmm. and so I just forgot to pack underwear on this trip, mm. and that's something that most people wouldn't uh, Uh-oh, have a problem stinky. with. <laughs> 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 yeah, the um the extroverted sensor types like. ISFP, ESFP, EST, ESTP or something. Those people are like good at sports because yeah. they're like really good at like their external environment and like reacting to it. And those are like the action hero types. Yes. Yeah. Noticing. No, noticing. Yeah. Noticing. Observation. I can't help but I mean maybe that's telling of my type, but I always think there's like there's a good there has to be bad types. There has to be a type that's bad. Like what's the worst type? Yeah, that's this is this is ENTJ mind rot. But there has to be. You're like, the, you're, like, you're, you're so hierarchical <laughs> in your mind that there has to be like you can't just be. You're like a J type. You have to like judge everything and like sort everything into a hierarchy. Um, but yeah. the worst type is ISFJ. <laughs> <laughs> is it? No, I just don't know. It's that's the opposite type of me. My my yeah. nemesis is ESFJ. Your nemesis? Oh, yeah. Yes, my nemesis. Who's your nemesis? <laughs> yeah, we don't understand each other at all. Yeah. I have a friend who's uh, ESFJ, and it's it's quite tiring to be around. He's like an extra extrovert. That's my mom. Yep, I'm. You have a real nemesis. Yeah, like an internet person or like someone in real life, like your neighbor. Real person, right? No, it's just I don't. It's not like you're. Like it's a... it's more like I try and talk to these people that are this opposite type of, type of me, and it's like talking to an alien. Like I genuinely don't understand where they're coming from, mm. what their motivations are. And what they want from me at all. Even if they say it very bluntly, it's just like, what? Yeah. Yeah. I feel that. 
I felt that on the, on the last episode with plastic pills because we, we were talking about um, COVID and like everything going online. And he's like, oh, that's great. I love like just not having to talk to people. Being that's animized. brutal. And I was like, oh. I felt like physically ill when I, he said that. Although I he, don't even like that. That's, that's when I realized <laughs> I was an extrovert because in Ottawa, everyone was talking about how uh, they hope that the pandemic goes on forever. So they oh, don't yeah. have to leave their What house. the fuck? Yeah, I think there was a, a like, w- what was weird about that was the people that would be okay with it were terminally online and also had the loudest voices while this stuff was happening and everyone else was like kind of forced to be online at the same time. So it kind of gave this like weird dynamic where maybe a minority of people were kind of like controlling the narrative of, of things, mm-hmm. you know, the psychological narrative of things for a lot of people. And, because of the hive mind, people bought into it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I personally think that it's you know, like, dude, if what is the point of just being so introverted that you're sitting by yourself and looking at pixels on a screen? Is that your going to be your life? Because I don't think that's what that's was. not that's not really introversion though. That's that's being like antisocial at that point. You know? Yeah. But some yeah. people, that's what they want. Well, know? I think that's what the world wants from them. It's easier to control them. It's true. And, but the present company is excluded, of course. Anyone watching this podcast is exempt. Yeah, you guys are great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nothing, nobody yeah. does that <laughs> at the all. That's the thing, right? Uh, d- so I'm like kind of like anti-consumerist too. But at the same time, I'm selling merch and stuff. So I, f- I don't know how to like feel about that because um, I'm like, you guys really don't need to, you know. I, I'm, like, I play video games and stuff, but I, I feel like there's a percentage of my audience, I guess, or that just, like, they, they spend too much time doing that sort of yeah. thing. And, uh, you know, I've got a sponsored video coming out soon that's, like, for a video game company. Yeah. And, uh, like, I'm sort of, like, I have some of the themes of my animations are to not, like, just to at least be aware of these kind of corporate interests, like, taking portions of your mind that you're not even aware of and commoditizing it. it. (laughs) And yet I'm, like, play video games. Well, you're not really. But Well, I'm going to be soon. But uh, I think all you can do is be hyper-aware of the contradiction and feel it. Feel it in your soul. You're you're also not everyone's dad. I'm just... If anyone, like, calls me out, I'm going to be like, guess what? I just... I just... Money. No one's going to call you out on it because everyone intuitively (laughs) understands (laughs) that you have to do that. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. the concept of selling out doesn't exist anymore. Like, if you... if you. If you are a small YouTuber and then you get your first sponsorship, you'll get comments being like, "Congratulations! Congratulations on getting your you first got sponsorship!" That bag. We're so happy for you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're selling out. You just, want you want to see your guy win. And it's anyone like that is story. saying that is, you know, they don't matter. <laughs> I, I've been taking turning down like sponsorships since the, basically the beginning of my channel, so I never really thought it would be. Um, well, usually I like respond back with like a like a brief, like I'll like I'll take your idea and I'll make this like video about yeah. it, right? And they never like want to do that. Mm-hmm. Which there's like a standing desk company, and I asked, them, I told them like I'll make a video where some guy's like using his desk, and then it keeps extending into the ceiling, and he gets crushed. <laughs> yeah, I remember <laughs> his you bones this. come yeah. out and stuff. <laughs> yeah, I guess they didn't like that concept. Yeah, I do. I do that shit all the time with my sponsorships, <laughs> yeah. like, and I get away with it most of the time. <laughs> um, yeah, you got to make you got to make it fun. Like a guy sitting at a desk and he just slowly rots. He's like he's like <laughs> sitting and typing, and like his like limbs fall off. His, bo- <laughs> his bones like turn to fucking honeycomb because mm-hmm. he's sitting all day. Mm. So you you guys have uh, you guys are working on this uh, animation where Oprah is a wheel. Tell us about that. <laughs> Hell yeah, we're working on this now. <laughs> the Oprah wheel, <laughs> written by JJ. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, JJ McCullough gave me this idea, and. Um, Oprah Winfield, we <laughs> wheel field. Oprah's Winfield. Uh, wheel. <laughs> she, she becomes. Oprah Win- yeah. wheel field. This is like JJ's impression of your work, which is like, oh yeah, you guys should do Oprah as a wheel. That's like right up your alley. <laughs> and then she's talking in a very deep voice. Right. That's the whole idea. But there's more to it than that. I can imagine. I could, I could see that in your style. Like the wheels just like slowly rolling down. I am Oprah. <laughs> See, this is what I mean. Like, people are like, "How do you, how you guys work? How do you divide the work?" It's like us sitting there being like, "Yeah, Oprah as a wheel, <laughs> Oprah. Oprah as a wheel for like hours, <laughs> and it just kind of cooks on the inside, yeah. and something eventually starts coming out." Hmm. I don't know. It's not. I don't, it's not like the way other people work. Like, there's no nine to five. I'm like, here's the schedule for today. Today you will be writing for two hours. And this is how you yeah. like outline it and blah blah blah. It's like that's just not how we do things. Yeah, that's a that's a common uh, common dichotomy in the artist workflow. It's like some people are like, I'm inspired every day at nine a.m. because I force myself to sit down and work, versus like just letting it come to you and then. Yeah, that's I, never worked for me. It doesn't work for me either. Like I I go long stretches of time, kind of just like stewing, and then it hits me like one day, and I'll like film edit post all on the same day. Yeah. I agree and disagree with that. Dep- for me it depends on what I'm doing exactly. If I'm making music, 
like uh, a lot of it just comes from messing around. You yeah. Know what I mean, and like if I'm not messing around, it's just never gonna come at all. You yeah. Know what I mean, because if I and I, if I go into it like, oh, I just have like a great music idea, and I go and sit down and do it, I can never recreate whatever that idea yeah. is. You know what I mean? Yeah, I but, get that. But for like writing, I guess, yeah, that makes sense. For me. No, no, I I get that as well. Like I sometimes if I am really blocked, all I have to do is just work on one thing, and then like the juices yeah start flowing. Yeah. Um, yeah. what are well, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to add to that. I want, I, want you, I want you guys to pitch some of the themes you expo- explore in safe mode. It's because, like, yeah, like, wh- like uh, not explain, but, like, what are the ideas you're playing with? Yeah, so the, one of the major ones is... Because this is the web series that they're working on now. Yeah, this is, like, comes after Interface, and it's not doesn't really have the same characters, but it, it makes sense after you watch Interface, but... Um, it's it's kind of like being in the Matrix, I guess. Except that's it, what I was gonna say. It's the opposite of watching the Matrix because, like, when you're like in no, well, yeah, it's yeah. it's just like a surrealist Matrix, basically. Um, but the, some of the ideas are more that y- your your brain resources are being occupied by like things that people sell to you, I guess, and you think are good for you, um, but then you don't actually realize that you're not like creating experiences and stuff for yourself. Mm. If that makes sense. Like mm-hmm. I, like a lot of people these days watch a lot of streaming and uh you know, it's like that thing where on, you know, Tinder profiles everyone's like I'm a I'm a you know, Netflix and chill or whatever. Not not Netflix and chill. You know what I mean? Like they just like watching Netflix or whatever yeah. or like a good portion of their day is just consuming content. Yeah, interests, Netflix, yeah. chill, internet, <laughs> but like the office, the but, office. Yeah, the office, the office always. But, and then it's like, well that's like you know, if you, if you watch a couple hours, that's like a, a tenth of your day, right? Mm-hmm. So that's a tenth of your mind. And you got all these shared sort of references that you joke with with your coworkers that are about these films and movies and stuff. But are they like, like how valuable is that? You know to what I mean? you as a person or yeah. the society? Is yeah. it 10% of your existence is like, like corporate references to products that were sold to you? Yeah, and that's why, and that's why the Seinfeld videos do well. It's because there's so many of those people. Exactly. Well, that's the thing. Well, of and that's, course. That's the, like, there's like a contradiction to my own animations where a lot of them are satirical and are based off of like self-referential or like pop culture references mm-hmm. that you wouldn't even understand if uh, if you hadn't consumed those. But everyone does understand it because it, it so permeates what we're doing. I mean, yeah. that is our culture. Our culture is internet culture, even more than our like actual Canadian identity. It's like being on the internet because that's where we spend most of our time. We spend more time on the internet than in real life. Yeah. So that and then you have culture. Then you have people at the same time being like, I wish I had more time to like play guitar or something or like, you know, I want to get fit or something. And they're like not doing any of these things because they're so locked into their yeah. their brick. But uh, yeah, I think <laughs> I think good art can take people out of that for a millisecond and get them to like get some self awareness about what they're doing. Also, uh, so the main characters, well, the two, one of the two main characters are uh, Smear and Lana, and so there's also this kind of contrast between this dude that's like kind of likes doing things the old way because he was he's like memories or whatever are comprised of like from before technology has gotten to this point and then there's like the zoomer kid or the whatever that's com- fully embraced in all Future this new zoomer. technology and using it and so there's sort of like an interesting um back and forth between like people who are like cautious i guess or cautiously going into the future and then people that are just fully into it you know Mm -hmm. i don't know if if he's even trying to go into the future he's just kind of like this is the way things are for me and she's like but you could also just do all these new things and and he just rejects it completely yeah so far anyways there's like there's like reasons There's, there's reasons for the way that he behaves and for instance like he doesn't like you could so in this web series we make if you die or get injured or whatever you could just like restore yourself right mm. and like from a cloud backup of your version of yourself because it's all matrixy right yeah but he's against it because like he'll he wouldn't retain any of the memories from since he last backed up and that if he does that then he's basically going to be this he'll just be like this perfect version of himself where he never makes any mistakes or right. you know and um and he's against that on like um, like psychological reasons, you right. know, because he thinks that's his ad- identity, you know. Right. And then the girl's just like, just fucking do it. You're gonna die. Like, and she gets mad at him. Like, if you don't do it, you're gonna die and be deleted, and, and no one will know about who you are, and mm-hmm. you know. That's a really big example. I was just thinking yeah. that he chooses to drive places and walk, and she's like, but you could just teleport. 
Right. Yeah. Oh, interesting. But yeah. think about like that. Even like even the little stuff. The, one of the things he says is like it's not about the destination. You know what I mean? I think that's about art and stuff too. Like it's not when I finish a project, I feel empty. You know? What am I, what's the point? Like like making interface was the thing for me, and when it was finished, I immediately started safe mode because I was like didn't know what to do with myself. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's being an artist. Yeah. Yeah. Someone uh, explained it to me. Do you know Alex Livingston? No. Did you ever come across him? He was he was a I pro- think a, I do. A prophet NASCAR. Yeah, it's water. Um but yeah, I, I was on the same thing and he was like, Oh, just imagine everything's practice. Like there is there's never a finished product. Mm-hmm. Like your entire life is just practice. Right. Like everything you do is just like a, a practice, like getting up and working. There's no there's no checkpoints yeah. of finished products. Yeah, exactly. And that really helped I me. I agree with that. There's yeah. just like landmarks in between all that practice, which was th- the things that you just decide are finished, you know? Yeah. I actually always had a hard time with that because as soon as I'm done a painting, like, I am much better about it now. Like, I put it away in plastic properly so, like, if someone buys it, it's in good shape. But when I was making art to begin with, I would just shove it in a box. It'd be, like, crumpled up. (laughs) It would just get wet. Like, I just didn't care about the thing that I was done with. Yeah. I was just so much into, like, thinking about the concept and making the piece of art that I didn't treat the finished product the way it should be treated yeah i I hate i hate that (laughs) i hate that uh, aspect of making art like taking care of it afterwards i have like so many paintings i've just shuffled between city and city and they're all dented and i whenever i (laughs) move i have to like put hot water on the back and like dry it with a blow dryer to retighten the canvas because they get so fucked up yeah i got some of that stuff still most of it i end up throwing out in the end because i'm like realistically no one's gonna buy this now and it looks like shit and it's old I had a self-portrait that I've been kept in, keeping since NASCAD, and I recently <laughs> just stabbed it to death with a knife. So yeah. I'm like, why the fuck am I keeping this still? Like, it, and at a certain point, you got to realize, like, what, like, why, what is it with, like, I made this piece of art once. It took me, like, a couple days. Like, why am I carrying it around with me the rest of my life? Yeah. I mean, just throw it out. It's done. Or give it to someone. Or just, yeah, Preferably I, give it to it's someone. It's weird but giving someone a self-portrait. It's yeah. Like, it's me. That's why I don't like self-portraits. It's like... I used to use myself to practice drawing faces, and people thought it's like me trying to be arrogant. Yeah. I, I, just, I hate so much. Yeah. So I had like 12 self portraits or something. I'm just like, what am I supposed to do with all of these? Just keep them around. You can, you can only give so many to your grandma, and then it's just like your grandma's a museum of you. Yeah. Yeah. Kill your darlings. That's another good, yeah. another good lesson is just like destroy shit you've made. I actually, I took, so in my first year of art school, I had, um, my entire portfolio of things I had made. And I was home for the summer after my first year. Mm-hmm. And I woke up, it was beside my bed on the floor. I'd just gotten home. And I woke up at 3 a.m. and power puked all over all of them. For some, I don't know what power came over puked. me. <laughs> like, literally like woke up projectile vomiting and destroyed every single piece of artwork I made in my oh, first year. Wow. Dude, everything, like just destroyed it. So it was kind of like, Meant to happen. Mm-hmm. It was a good thing because I was like, okay, this is like all these memories are just gone. Yeah. All these things I drew. I'm like, oh, my first year of art school and this bag I drew this one time that took me five minutes and this, this yeah. study I Those did. are the worst projects. Destroyed. You got like canvases of like olives. Yeah. It's like, why do I need this? Uh, yeah. Yeah. They don't teach you that either in art school. They don't like tell you to not be so sentimental about your own artwork. Do they? I never was taught that, I felt like. I had, I had a few profs that were really... I had, I had a prof that would do an exercise where you would spend... We, we would get a modeling class and you would spend like three hours, like like one three hour session. You can't move. There's no break. Just drawing a model. And everyone's exhausted by the end of it. At the end, you had to erase it. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's a good it exercise. Was like, it was like yeah. his first class of like model drawing. Mm-hmm. It was the intro, the intro first week class, which I like. I love that in retrospect. And I remember like there was like students like crying and shit. Probably. And there was this one woman who was like yelling at him. She's like, I'm not doing this. I refuse. Like, this is so mean. And yeah. he was like, no, like. You're getting marked. You'll you'll get a mark to zero if you don't destroy this drawing. Right. That's a great. I, I like that idea. Yeah, it was a really great idea. I was actually thinking of starting an art challenge called like the Eraser Challenge, where every day you draw something, and then the next day you show up, you erase everything, and you draw on the same paper because like you know, there's always like a little bit left over. Yeah. So you have these like echoes of like the previous day in your thoughts, but like you're never just like accumulating this like 30 drawings or something you're always reworking something completely new every single day yeah that's a good idea people need to get used to that idea i mean that's i think that that the concept of being a 
extended past art, like just being attached to your ideas and everything is, is, is many people's crux. If you think it like, yeah, I was going to say that next actually. In like in tech companies, um, I know it's like a big problem of over engineering solutions to problems that don't need to exist. Yeah. Is like, they'll create, like you just create a problem like, Oh, the users need this, but like they don't need that in the first place. And then spend $50 million in two years developing a solution to something that like literally the whole process could just be erased from existence and nothing would change. It's everyone's issue is just getting too attached to their own ideas, their own intellectual property. You really need to practice just destroying shit. Mm -hmm. And you destroy your relationships too. Burn all your bridges. (laughs) Just walked out of the bathroom and Brogan's like perched on the couch. (laughs) I don't know, like a lucid, vaguely psychotic (laughs) room. Yeah, a little bit. Your eyes were a bit shiny. (laughs) Destroy everything. (laughs) (laughs) When you're you're on a lucid rant, your eyes do, do something. I know I have that that blue eye thing that um see that meme all the time it's like talking to a guy with blue eyes and it's just like people like avoiding their gaze and it cuts to him and he's like <laughs> yeah. and his eyes are fucking crystal a little blue. bit start playing that limpistic track limpistic track yeah behind blue eyes oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah what things get very quiet you have to look that up later it's actually a good song yeah. Oh, yeah? for Limp Bizkit it's I mean, a Pink Floyd song is it, yeah. or no it's a, it's a Who song right uh, yeah 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 well that's why it's a cover of the I, Who I song I do like the, the Limp Bizkit version of it from the songwriting era I don't era. really like Limp Bizkit but you know but. behind blue eyes so there's nothing <laughs> it's, just, <laughs> it's just fear <laughs> Well, if we're still talking about, like, artists and, like, your work and your relationship to your art, I think um, a huge obstacle for pretty much every single artist is their own ego. Yeah. Like, people get way too... They think their work is them, and so they're so attached to it that they're not willing to either change it or get rid of it or or make something that they it doesn't personally represent them, like their views or something. I've been noticing this about... Um, pop culture Arms. references in general. Like I was talking about how everyone consumes so much content where it becomes part of them, right? The moment you start criticizing something, like from just like a, just like I'm an artist, like, like I think I about Roblox. things critically, right? <laughs> like cri- like critical reviews of like art or, fain- or pa- paintings, or whatever. People will like get violent if you, yeah. if you like aren't completely just praising some piece of art, you know? And even if you like make benign comments about something, you know? And I feel it's because like people have consumed so much stuff that they feel like you're attacking them when you're talking about a piece of like, like an arrangement of color or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's really strange. Like Star Wars? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like I hate Star Wars, so. Hmm. It's, it's, <laughs> their, it's their identity you almost. What? You what? Get her. I wish people would appreciate and you know be fans of content and create creations like star wars and stuff but it's not they have to like remind themselves it's it's not them what's supposed to fill in my identity then well what's the problem (laughs) who are you underneath all that Uh, let's see underneath that's too scary to think about percent meme references 16 percent wikipedia articles uh maybe like nine percent video essays (laughs) what are you underneath that though um there's a th- the hu- there's a large amygdala, um, too, and too big. Uh, there's a, there's the there's the three spheres of uh, the uh, irony protection layer. Um, then the, then there's the then there's the the sniveling child, uh, and then below that I don't know maybe some reptile stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, it'd be cool to kind of collect like to do like a big poll over a year and find all the pieces of media you're not allowed to critique. Like Ocarina of Time, mm, is yeah. there is there a you know, is yes. there a video game review to learn video? Who rules over you. Simply find out who you're not allowed to criticize. Yeah, Ocarina, Ocarina of, of Time, <laughs> um, Mario Kart 64, <laughs> Star, Star Trek. Wars, Star Trek. Clearly, those clearly old school Nintendos. Who rules over us then? Yeah. yeah, yeah, but just look. Is is there a video on the internet of someone giving Ocarina of Time an eight out of ten? Were probably di- not. They're probably dead. Yeah. They were murdered. Yeah, literally, it's it's insane. Things you're not allowed to criticize, like no, no one Skyrim. killed them, but just no one to associate them for long enough that they lost all their community and died. Yeah, that's pretty much death, though. Yeah, they're like, I was okay, I was okay on the uh, anti-Semitic rant, but Ocarina of Time critici- criticize, yeah. <laughs> God, I have to unsub. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I think I think I think what we're getting at is just like there's identity gaps that don't get filled in with community. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. But it's okay if someone like is like such a big fan of me, for example, that that's their identity. You're the only exception, yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Actually, we're, we are the only exceptions. Everyone in this room. Right. Yeah. yeah. 
to become our family. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm a ghost on the internet, so I don't know if I count. That analog life. I, I think, yeah, I think it comes down to the, the contradiction of, like, I don't feel happy looking at my screen, but I also only make money if I make people look at their screen. Right, exactly. Yeah. It's such a gross feeling. It is a gross feeling. You ever stream? Uh, I do, yeah. Well, like, once a month, what? actually. I know, I feel like with streaming, too. Because I... I, I I never watch streamers. Yeah. I am like almost like vehemently against watching streamers. Mm -hmm. And then I'll stream once a week and get like 60, 60 viewers and they'll give me like money. Mm -hmm. I'm like, why is, why am I making this exception for myself? It's okay. I feel if you do once in a while, it's not a big deal. You know, it's the guys that do it every single day. You're more streamed than men. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Exactly. Like Destiny is an art piece. His life, entire life is an art piece. (laughs) It's like he he is the work. Does he stream every day? He streams 12 hours a day. 12 hours. Forever. 12 yeah, hours. Ma- I might be wrong in a while. I don't keep okay. up. Probably, probably like five. Hours. But like, yeah, yeah, yeah I, 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 there are streamers that stream more of their waking hours than they don't. So at that point, you are more of a, of a, like, a digital entity than you are a real person. There's like, you know, Ice Poseidon. You ever heard that name? Yeah, I'm, yes. I'm aware of who that is. Yeah, because he did like the IRL streaming and lost his mind. Like, he was just streaming his entire existence. Everywhere he'd go, he'd have the stream going. Yeah. And then he started like behaving as if he's a, a video game character for the chat. How old was he? How old was he? Yeah. I think he was like in his late twenties. Interesting. I feel like it's a I feel it's a zoomer. Zoom like zoomers have this pretty bad um the, the internet mind stuff because they're just like they don't know anything else. Yeah, it's like if you're not streaming, who are you really? You're not even alive, really. Yeah, if you're yeah. not making money off of yeah. your existence, if you're not you're not capitalizing on just everyday behavior yeah if you don't post online you might as well just be dead yeah man do you know who dr k is yeah yeah uh, it's very interesting watching his like therapy streams of like streamers and what kind of stuff comes up yeah like what they're trying to push by push away by like streaming all day basically yeah there, there's no such thing as a person on the internet who's like living a good life it's all there's all this mental illness there yeah <laughs> or like anybody who anybody who wants to be seen a little bit Right, even like Simone de Beauvoir in her autobiography. That's how she ends it. She was like, "Why, like, if I don't write this down, my life was worthless." Basically, mm. it's like the thesis of her autobiography. Yeah, yeah, it's very strange. It's it's a weird thing to think about because some people are perfectly happy, never creating anything and having any kind of like presence like that. Like they'll just you know live like have a house and get old. Yeah, and, and they're fine with that. But then yeah. for some reason, many such, many such people, you know, many such people. And then for some reason, we're in this like weird category of like, we have to create stuff or yeah. it hurts. I like how we're criticizing streamers for like this desire to be known while we're like monetizing artists. a conversation. Don't bring, don't bring that up. But <laughs> as artists, we're doing the same thing. We're just constantly making shit so that like, that's what lives, I just said, lives bro. Longer. Yeah. Well, I'm rephrasing it and saying that yeah, it was my idea. So. Yeah. But I know <laughs> all the way. And we're talking about it as we monetize this conversation. You're going to tweet this later. And it's uh, going to be like, I podcast. thought it was. Oh, we're not monetized. <laughs> the, the YouTube channel's not monetized yet. We are eventually going to monetize this. It. This is organic. We don't do this for it's, money. Yeah, we're doing this for fun. Yeah. I mean, I'm probably going to make zero dollars off of this, to be quite honest. So. That's true. No one's going to buy any, like, cardinal mar- mugs for their grandma for me, so, at all. <laughs> they, no one's going to buy the I Will Never Kill Myself mug? We should, we people should get, will pl- buy plenty of these shirts uh, yes, that are yes, on umamimerch.com. Yes, <laughs> well, yeah, you, that's a reference to, what, something, where did you, where's, what's that's that That's real. To? Uh, the CIA developed this program called the Gateway Process, which is basically getting like high from like listening to audio clips. I show off that shirt, close it's closer to the lens, and I, I keep there. explaining it. And uh, so I took my main character from safe mode, and I like read a design so that it looks like one of the drawings in their their di- Gateway Process handbook. So oh, that yeah? I could uh, yes, the gateway, the CIA you gateway said that. experiments. So, so I could make money off of it. Good. The CIA. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I guess you know if people want to buy things, they can buy them. No one forces you to buy anything. That's what I tell myself. I'm, gl- I'm glad we've I'm glad we've reached that point in the conversation. If people want to buy things, they can buy things. Yeah. Um, if I dropped a million dollars into your lap and said make your dream project, would you do anything different? Because that's what I was thinking during Buffer Fest. The, the, everything was like so highly produced. Mm-hmm. You were th- you're, you were three people, umami, um, and you there's, the there's, there's an u, there's a mom, and there's an e, um, and you didn't need to you know like I'm like 
how much money do you think that first one with um uh what's that guy's name? The the celebrity. Oh yeah, the the one with anyway. Terry Cruz. How, like yeah. how much do you think like there was they were spending at least ten thousand, probably more. Probably, yeah. Probably like hundred thousand. Th- probably I'd say, uh, yeah. Maybe well, maybe not that much, but ten yeah. like they're spending like probably in the ballpark of like five figures mm-hmm. to make these short films. I think that guy had a lot of connections though. It's yeah. not it's not like he didn't have to pay I mean, for I'm, some w- of that. Give us give some context here because I just missed Oh, we, we, but in Buffer Fest, a lot of uh, really 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 well shot short films. Yeah. Um beautiful stuff. I, very great work. I enjoyed all of them. Yeah, we um, don't want to trash it. It's yeah, just yeah. we're talking about how much the project probably cost because it was so high production. Yes. Yeah. But in terms of like with actors that are real of, like, actors. Audience reaction and uh in terms of I think like the actual quality of the art, uh, I like. I mean, I you guys blew it away. The, 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 with the, like without the budget, I mean, I yeah. assume like I, the budget would make our content worse, probably. Yeah, because I would be more removed from it. Yeah, as I'm just being like dolling out work to a, a, a crew of animators. Yeah, and uh, it would get produced faster, which would probably be a good thing. And I'd probably be a little bit less depressed about sitting in my room all day drawing. Yeah. Um, We'd but, probably have like a permanent home. But a million dollars really isn't that much money anymore these days. That buys you about fourteen sandwiches. Yeah, Canadian <laughs> dollars. Such a Canadian one latte. I mean, buys you yeah. like two <laughs> shitty condos in Montreal that are flooding in the basement. One, yeah. yeah. So. One probably now. So like, let's say if it was like ten million dollars, and I, that's like a little bit more, like reasonable in terms yeah, of being able to. I mean, realistically, at one episode, like a <laughs> pilot for animation, like a like for that goes on like, like a Cartoon real Network or whatever, it costs about a million dollars. So you'd really only make one like thirty minute animation. Damn, Jeez. If yeah. You like hire everyone professionally, properly, and that sort of thing. It's really expensive. Yeah, not just be crazy in your room. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that so basically, you know, making one episode or something that's probably gonna be worse than the shit I just make up when I'm like yeah. Manic. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's worth it. Yeah. Hmm. It would be cool. I'd probably put the money in the like real estate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, land. honestly. We'd like invest it <laughs> and just keep All doing what land. we're doing. I'd be like, use this to make a uh, make art and then yeah. you'd, be, you'd like, be like finally a real home. Estate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Rental properties. I mean, that's part of it though, is like he'd probably make better work if, if he you didn't had, feel like he has yeah, to if you weren't worried about like rent and stuff. Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah, that is that's a another, permanent place to live. <laughs> <laughs> another another uh, another case for UBI right here in this Good conversation. Art. Just give people You know, there's an entire uh, Joy Division. That music scene mm-hmm. came out of basically UBI. Oh really? Yeah, because that area was really uh, industry heavy into the fifties and sixties in the UK and then all the industry died. And then they subsidized all, like, literally everyone lost. It was, like, 80% unemployment in um, Sheffield, I think, is the name of the city. Mm. So they had all the apartments and the condos dropped down to, like, basically nothing. Rent was, like, $100 a month, 50 bucks a month. And then they had UBI, and everyone got a, everyone got a government job. They had to work 30 hours a day just to, like, keep the economy going. Mm. And then within that two-year span, it was, like, uh, Joy Division and, like, eight other bands popped out of this area because they had the time to make good music right where it wasn't like oh i can actually just make what i want to make i don't have to worry about this being marketable yeah same with like you could make the argument for like soho in the 50s all the artists living in just like studio lofts yeah making art and that's where like i don't know velvet underground bob dylan andy warhol all comes from that era where just, it was like just enough money to keep your apartment above water yeah like you have a house for like your head above water you, yeah, you, you can like, you can make 200 bucks a month in income and not be homeless oh. right sounds like communism yeah to me. yeah yeah, yeah really <laughs> Don't talk about that dirty shit with me. <laughs> anyway, let's let's get back to the Fountainhead. So Communist? you're you're a fan of Ayn Rand? Uh, yes, well, obviously, because uh, I've read head. that book. That means I agree with every single thing that she's yeah. written yeah. down, word for word. He studies that like a Bible on the bathroom every morning. <laughs> <laughs> and and you know, there's there's no way you can just take sections of it and sort of agree with them. Yeah. What's what's your what's your favorite Ayn Rand banger? <laughs> Uh, the one where she writes a story about how the main character blows up a children's hospital because <laughs> <laughs> they because they didn't like the branding. Yeah, because like they like put like a design motif on the top that wasn't like part of the design of the architectural. Plans. And then while she's writing, she's like shedding a tear because he's like, "She's so he's so brave. <laughs> he's the only guy that could do this." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's like a there's like a chapter at the end of that book that's like there's like no paragraphs there's just it's just a big rant that goes on forever hmm. and he's like it's like a I don't know it was um 
I don't know how I got through that book. I must have been like... <laughs> you lived with, at it, your parents' house yeah, and there was nothing the, to do. Yeah, the yeah. Fountainhead? The font, yeah. I yeah. could do it with some Vyvanse. Font, it's like font size like three and it's like 700 pages, something like that. Yeah, that's a long book and I got through 200 pages. Hmm. Yeah. Fun fact about that copy specifically. I've told this story before. But um, that's like a vintage copy I found thrifting. <laughs> and um, I had it beside my bed. I was reading it. And I was out of my apartment for the night. And my roommates, one of my friends came over. One of my roommate's friends came over and, <laughs> and did a bunch of heroin. And then <laughs> <laughs> okay. nodded off in my bed and spilt whiskey all over it. So all the pages are stuck together. And I always wonder if there's allegory there. That's why I bring it up. It's like you vomiting on your artwork. It's like me vomiting on my artwork. <laughs> it's so meaningful. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's possible. It's a sign. <clears throat> okay, well, we've been going for uh, how long? Hour and a half. Hour and a half. We should, we should, uh, we should, we should close it up. Should mm-hmm. we? Yeah. yeah. With, that so. sto- with that story. Twenty four hours. Well, well, that what time the is that? Gotta, we gotta get going soon, don't we? Yeah. We have to go to a gala. I have to get my award, yes. which I know I have already won. Yes. No, I didn't. We we I we, 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 voted, we, no we, we voted for you last night. No, I was we, sick. <laughs> and then we ignored everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we're uh, we're going to a gala. That's what's next for us. We're gonna Brogan's coming as well. Cool. Um, we got a, we got an extra ticket for him, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna watch you get your award. <laughs> nah, nah, we don't know if we and have. If one. you don't get your award, I'm gonna riot. No. I'm gonna riot. I will be okay do, do if Kanye I don't get West. an award. Yeah, oh, mommy I'm, had the best. I'm gonna let you finish. <laughs> I'm gonna let you finish. Mommy had the best animation of all. Time. <laughs> <laughs> we we don't come here just to get awards. We no. just want to hang out with people. Yeah, yeah. Have yeah. a good time. Yeah, yeah. That's what that's what the that's what the YouTube uh, events are all about. It's not like uh, the yakety yak and the actual stuff that you do is always just like a prop for actually talking to people, and meeting people in your field, doing what you're doing, building community. So we're that's what we're trying to do here. Yeah, community. Yeah. yeah. That's the real horseshoe theory. That's the real horseshoe theory. Is it really?